Good evening. I'd like to call the Monday, June 4th, regular select board meeting for Berlin to order. Uh, to my far left is Pete Kelly, Wayne Lamberton, and to my right is Angelina Capron. Um, with us also is Diane Isabel and Town Administrator Dana Hadley. Um, any additions or changes to the agenda, Dana? Um, Brad, I'd like to add a, since Tim is here, a discussion on the road grader that needs some repairs, and I'd like him to tell you about it. Okay. Anything else? That's all. Okay. Um, public comment? Hearing none. Uh, uh, Treasurer's report, Diane? Um, we've, I've been talking with the um, attorneys as far as tax sales, and we have sent a, a set up an a tentative date of August 9th for tax sales. At this point in time, we have six properties. Thank you. Uh, and when we come closer to the tax sale, then I will present them to the board. But in the meantime, obviously, uh, the residents can come through and, and pay for them. And there might be a couple that we pay for, so they might not all go to tax sale. But I just want to make you aware, at least we have a date that we've established at this point in time. I also wanted to just mention that the assessors have sent out the change of appraisal notices to, to the residents. And I believe that they are going to be meeting for grievances on June 14th. That is my understanding from them. Um, the other thing that I would talk about a little bit is, and I will present it uh, next, next time that we have a meeting, is um, I want to get some uh, the, the under $5 fees waived, okay? And also, I'd like to be able to talk about having the late filers fees waived. But I will bring that up on the agenda at the next meeting. So just to make you aware, we'll be discussing that. The late filers is the homestead yes. issue. Yes, people that file their taxes late. Got it. Yeah. And the under $5, obviously, is just... Uh, right, we've done that before. Yep, yeah. quite a few times. That's all so you're thinking next time? The next, yeah, the next meeting we'll put that on the agenda. Okay. I'll discuss that. Since Pete's still looking at the warrants, we'll take and go with the uh, uh, Beth. Yep. The Emerald, Emerald. Yeah, thanks. So I'm here as the town tree warden. Um, and I gave you a little informational thing. Obviously, I copied and pasted some of this because there are no pictures, <laughs> as uh, suggested in some of this. Um, so uh, this is just sort of an overview to give you some general information on what's going on. Um, emerald ash borer is an invasive species that has been in the United States uh, since the early 2000s, late 1990s. It's progressed across the Mid Lakes um, region through Pennsylvania, New York, Massachusetts, Quebec, New Hampshire, and was found in Vermont uh, this past month. Um, it was found in uh, Maine, northern Maine actually, at the end of May, so just like within the past two weeks. Um, this is a pest that preys on species of the ash genus only, white ash, black ash, green ash, brown ash. Mountain ash is not a true ash. It does not host that tree. Um, it, it kills the tree. Uh, there is no known successful control mechanism for ash. So from a forestry standpoint, there, that's a huge economic and management issue. From a roadside tree standpoint, it's a huge um, uh, potential cost and safety issue. Um, so I, as tree warden, I'm here to discuss specifically roadside trees. Um, the state has been very cooperative and, and proactive in putting together uh, some suggested um, plans for how to evaluate what's going on and some suggestions with how to deal with it. Um, and I've been talking with them. There may be some grant money down the road which is probably more detailed than we need right now. Um, but I think that to start with, uh, it was initially identified in um, right near the intersection of Washington, Orange, and Caledonia counties on Brook Road and Plainfield. It travels or spreads at a rate of about two miles a year. It takes approximately five years for an infestation to become 
um, dense enough to identify. So by the time you identify it, it's here. It's killing trees. We are in a high-risk area because of our proximity to the initial infestation site. There are now five sites that they've identified the presence of emerald ash borer um, in, in a couple different towns. I think Barry Town is the closest. Montpelier, actually, they just identified it there, so I guess that's closer. It's likely that it's in Berlin, okay? Um, even though ash statewide is approximately 5% of our uh, tree population, as I drive around the roads here in Berlin, I'm guessing it's much higher. Uh, so that puts us in an even higher risk area. Um, the primary mechanism for spread is people. Firewood, logs, pulpwood, that sort of thing. So, um, so, I'm, I'm, uh, so it's something that we need to address. And uh, if you flip to the third page of um, what I've provided here, um, this is a general overview of uh, a way to proceed with figuring out how to deal with this. Um, the first item in the action plan would be to um, determine our road right of way widths. Perhaps this is information that we already have, but since we're already, you know, we're only dealing with trees or specifically dealing with trees in the road right of way, we need to know what those widths are. Uh, the second seems just to be responsible members of the community to notify the public um, that there will be an inventory taking place to identify trees that are within the road right of way um, and then perhaps uh, expand the discussion to those trees that are proximal to the road right of way that are um, has potential hazard trees or high risk trees. Um, as I drive around the, the town, and especially if you go, or a good example is if you go up Crosstown Road, um, there, are, there is a power line right of way on the right side of the road, and that power line right of way is lined with ash trees that are not in the town right of way. So as part of this, uh, it might be uh, an important feature to keep good communication and dialogue going with the utilities to know what their plan is and how they're dealing with this. Um, and then a, a, you know, a plan for removal needs to be developed. Uh, that could involve um, moving round wood to a local site and having it available as firewood to local residents. It could involve a more centralized uh, deposition site. Casella has been talking with the state as having some interest in a, in a potential site for that. Um, it could involve having it chipped on site and blown back into the landowner's property. All of those have a cost. Um, and I don't know what our, you know, sort of how, all of the things we need to figure out is how do you do that? Do you hire a contractor in? Do we do it in house? Um, and I, those are things I don't, you know, just bringing it to your attention because it's, it's sort of, it's on the radar. Um, but one thing for you to keep in mind, and, and these are, as this is sort of uh, researched information. Um, because of the way emerald ash borer infests the tree, it doesn't start from the crown down. It typically infests the main stem, um, perhaps where upper branches are leaving the main bowl of the tree. The structural integrity of the tree um, falls apart very quickly. So when these trees die, research shows that it's as much as three times more expensive to remove them as it is to do that before they die. Because they fall apart. Because they fall apart. They're a risk. They're a liability. Yeah. There's also some, you know, some of the, just the structural way ash grows and the, the grain of it uh, lend, that also adds to that. But it's also, much has, much of it has to do with the way the emerald ash borer affects the tree. 
So if we remove the trees, because earlier you said the spread of this is pretty much human, you mm -hmm. know, firewood. So if we make it into firewood or we chip it or we blow it back onto the property, yeah. as long as a similar tree is not available, these things will die or are we just... Uh, no, um, uh, okay. it's here. It, it, once it's here, it's here. And it will infect trees half inch diameter and larger. Period. <clears throat> so basically, the trees that are outside the towns right away. They're going to die. Are going to be infested anyway. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I was thinking the same thing. If we bring the firewood here, are we bringing the disease here? But it's here anyway. It's here anyway. Yeah, and if it's not, it, and, uh, so if we cut trees that are not infested, and, you know, let's say right tomorrow we cut every ash tree in the town right of way, brought all that round wood to the town garage and had the public come and take it, we're not spreading anything. If there is, um, if there are larvae in those trees, potentially we're spreading it within the town. Um, so all, so what we're doing in that case is maybe speeding up the spread of something that's going to get here anyway. Also making use of something that we have to do something with anyhow. Do we burn with the town garage? No. Is there a natural predator in this? They, there, um, there are a couple types of uh, parasitic wasps that prey on this type of beetle and they've played around with it. I think New Hampshire has actually imported a couple species from Asia where it comes from. Um, nothing is really impacting the, um, the spread or the, of the population. So one of the things Vermont, by establishing a quarantine, and I'm sorry I talking fast and forgot that part. We are in a quarantine area, so there are specific regulations on what can happen with ash trees in the town of Berlin. Um, they've quarantined the whole state, okay? But given that, there are recommendations on how to slow the spread, and that's basically um, restricting the movement of um, ash within the, within the high-risk areas which we're in. Um, during the quote-unquote fly months, though, so that's the, the from May 1st to October 1st when the beetle is active. Moving ash within the town of Berlin is not is not going to change that. Oh, I think you know, I saw a sign driving towards Danville yes. or something. Yes. You know, I was like, what are that? Yeah, that's what it is. Oh, Beth, do you know if any other community has developed a plan, an action plan? Yet? I don't. Okay, yeah, yep. Um, Danielle Fitzko uh, with the state is the urban forestry coordinator. Uh -huh. And I've, I've been corresponding with her. She's meeting with utilities. She's talking with other communities. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm kind of in contact with her to get the best available information to guide us forward. So do you think that maybe public notification without communication would be one of the first steps that we would I think one of the things we need to know is just, just what we have to deal with. Um, I, in my little world, which isn't much of Berlin, um, I see a lot of ash trees that are just outside the right of way. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what we can do there. Yeah. Um, but other town roads, we, we really need to do an inventory of roads that are within the road right of way to know just how much we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And I'm willing to take that on and get a group together and, and implement that inventory. Um, so, and you're saying, and I'm sorry, I'm a little slow on this. Sure, but, um, I'm talking fast, I'm sorry. Um, you're saying that even though the tree may look healthy, mm -hmm. it's best to remove it. Yes. Before it becomes unhealthy. Yes. Right. So Brad, you may be able to answer this, but would there be any advantage in contacting a firewood provider to have those trees for free or is that too much work or too close to the road too problematic I should say for them to have them for nothing to cut them up and so on if they're in the biz well I mean uh, firewood long length is selling for around 110 a cord now I mean why would you give it away well so we don't have to deal with the issue incur the cost yeah, yeah. If, if we marked the trees and said, <clears throat> of course we would have to deal with 
private landowners or whatever, yeah. if they could have them and if they could cut them up. Well, I mean, the uh, first thing is, is uh, even with even with the infestation that's around here, are the trees have any value for lo for lumber? Some of them might. But if they're fairly healthy and but but along with the firewood, you couldn't sell them outside this area, right? You there are uh, there is one market that I know of in the quarantine area that's buying ash saw logs. I think the issue there would be uh, the the logistics of how to get three would, ash logs right, yeah, right. It just may economically, you know, feasibly to to a place in Groton. That's why they just cost three hundred dollars. Yeah, just yeah. chop it up, throw it in your truck, and sell it. That's, that's firewood. Even that might not be worth it. But well, I mean, you get one tree here. And that's that's the hard tree part. A mile away. Yeah. I mean, it, it, so right now, if if the tree is chipped, the chip wood can can be moved around. Um, it's considered the chips are considered small enough to have killed the larva or stopped the potential spread. But I can't, I was trying to picture, I, you know, are there guys that have set up small enough that they could go to a tree here and a tree quarter of a mile down the road and cut it and chip it and make that anything worthwhile? Mm -hmm. I don't know anybody like that. Yeah. There might be, there might be people out there. I mean, maybe it's a new, new business stream. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It's a, I mean, the trouble is, is that you're not dealing with, uh, with firewood, you're looking at trees, um, 12 to 20 inches, pretty, you know, you're not looking at anything too beautiful for a stem, but I mean, you're looking at a, a fairly consistent piece that will go through a processor. Right. Um, then, uh, you know, if you have a, a tree that is uh, uh, good enough for a log, if you were to, able to uh, bring them back and, and yard them somewhere until you got enough. Mm -hmm. How does the insect, where does it live in the tree? Is it in the cambium layer or? Yeah, so what happens is the beetle lays eggs in the, in the main stem of the tree and um, those larvae hatch and they eat the cambium of the tree. The, the detrimental part is, first of all, their population explodes so quickly. The larvae are fairly large and they do this zigzag pattern through the tree that um, just uh, girdles the tree. Yeah. Uh, that one of the easiest ways to identify a tree that's been infested is by the woodpecker um, getting at the yeah. larva. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, and it and it, it's it's here and it it really stinks. Yeah. It just really stinks. Well, the only thing there is is that though the road we have the right of way through the through the land, but. If uh, you were to educate the uh, landowners that they're either going to have a tree worth X number of dollars for, for either turnings for uh, axe handles, right. or they're going to have a pile of firewood for conservative glass, right. it would behoove them to, uh, to uh, have know. a logger go in and maybe look at it. Yeah. Before it's just a dead tree that's worth nothing. The other thing is, of course, I mean, if you in, in your travels when you inventory the town's trees, it might be worthwhile talking to the landowners and see if they'd be willing to do an ash cut. Yeah, I think that's I, I think that's part of why I, I I believe it makes sense to put out some sort of informational. You know, this is what ash, emerald ash borer is. This is how it affects the tree. This is the research and that we're going to be specifically looking at roadside trees. Um, but I'm, anybody that's got a, a wood lot, I'm sure they, their forester has been in touch with them to educate them on this. You know, uh, the county forester is a really good resource. I think it's the people that have a half acre to 10 acres that might not recognize how much ash they have yeah. on their property. And uh, again, I think it's the, the grays land that, that's up on the road there, those stems are all six to ten inches. You know, they're, from a value standpoint, there's not a lot there. From the utility standpoint, when all those trees die, <laughs> yeah. there's a real problem for them. That, not, that's, I yeah. think, how I'm viewing this. I'm yeah. not looking at money made, I'm looking at money saved. 
or, or that's value the big pro- thing yeah. for us. That's the big thing. Yeah, yeah. is it the cost of, of just managing those trees? Yeah. Now, the hard part with doing it in town right away, you have maybe a band of ten feet on the edge of the road, mm-hmm. right. and if you get a hold of the landowner, well, then you have a place to. Okay. Now, does the, does the, once the tree is dead, mm-hmm. the beetles are out of luck? Yep. Um, so I was surprised to hear today that in a, uh, so I was asking about, well, what if you cut the trees? How long does the beetle persist? Yeah. And what I, the information I got from the state is that they'll reside in that tree for up to a year. And that surprised me because ash dries out pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, but yes, they're looking for a, a better host. Yeah. Now, do those beetles live in other trees? Or only just ash. Only Fraxinus, ash. the genus Fraxinus. Yep, that's it. Yep. Yep. That's all I have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it stinks. Um, so, so I guess what I'm, uh, what I'm proposing is that, and I don't know if we have this information somewhere to know exactly what the town right-of-way widths are on all of our town roads. We have... Um, many roads, many, a lot of information that uh, the clerk okay. has in her office. In, in the, um, do we have every single road? Probably not. Okay. Um, but I think we certainly could pull together what we do have. Yeah. And I'll speak to Rosemary and Corinne about it. To yeah. See if they can help me pull it together. That would be great. Um, yeah. So that you have an idea of where you are. Okay. Um, and I also think, and I wait to get in kind of advice from you of when you know we could put this on our website or other ways sure. that we can get this information out to um, yep. residents of the town. Yep. Front um, porch forum, maybe. Or front porch forum. Yeah. Think, yep. Know, yep. Could we send them the tax bills? We could. When did they go out? Um, they will be going out in July. Oh. Probably about okay. around the tenth. That'd be a good way. That's a good way. Okay. Everybody um, <laughs> Well, not everyone. <laughs> um, Some people don't know. <laughs> I can put it together, sort of a little informational thing, and then perhaps if you and I could work on language just to alert sure. folks that we're going to be doing this inventory and right. it's here. Yeah. Does that I mean, make sense? I think that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then an invent- well, inventory, roadside trees. I guess the other thing, just as an aside, I mean, this ash sort of brings it all to a point where we need to discuss it. But uh, there are other trees inside the town road right of way that probably need to be dealt with if we're doing this anyhow. I, um, a, a dead elm, it comes to mind. I know there's a couple up around my house. We've um, had a lot of um, discussion on trees. Mm-hmm. and. As you know, it's very expensive. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we've spent, you know, maybe up to a thousand dollars on one tree. Yep. And our budget, unless yep. we do something different, mm-hmm. doesn't support that. Yep. And I'd like to say we could take care of it immediately, but it certainly concerns me. Um, That's yeah. what I was thinking. If you yeah. can find somebody to have that had a use for that, that you could just give it to them, but. And I'm thinking of, you know, there's many trees, Tim, I'm sure that you can think of that should be taken down, you know. Yeah, so. and they're not ones the power line will deal with. It's, and, yeah. no, that would be the best thing, but you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I bring it up because if we know we have to deal with some percentage of what's in the right-of-way anyhow, then maybe it's more cost-effective if we're there anyway right. to look at some of these right. other things. Right, and it doesn't hurt us to have a plan. Yeah. To, okay. Yeah. Yeah. We might be able to add enough volume so that we can that's made it. Yeah. But if it was somebody could make a fuck at it. Well, uh, they they logged out on the Berlin Palm this winter mm-hmm. on the field road, and they took a lot of ash because it was way up. Mm-hmm. The price of it was way oh, up. Oh yeah. yeah. Because of this, and he cut a ton of ash out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. I guess the other part of it, I don't know, I can't think of any place, but again, I'm, my, my corner is small. Um, if there's any high conservation value ash that are in the town on public land or within the town right of way, uh, there are ways to treat the ash to, um, so that the emerald ash borer doesn't get into it. 
It's not a one-time treatment. The tree needs to be treated every two to three years for the rest of its life, and I'm guessing it's expensive. But if there's something out there that has high value, then we should certainly put that, you know, sort of consider that in the plan. <coughs> Are um, you going to speak to the Conservation Commission? About I already this? have. Have you? Yeah. 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 Um, and we did, we couldn't think of anything, but so but I'm just just in case. Because I don't, yeah, I was yeah. just thinking they would know yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so uh, so once the inventory is done, a uh, uh, plan for the removal of these trees needs to be developed. Um, and that could that needs to include somehow uh, a disposal mechanism, whether it's a, a central site that the, the the timber is brought to, or chipped on site, or somebody comes and you know sort of contracts to take it away. Um, I mentioned that there's a fly season, the um, from October 1st until May 1st, so through the fall winter months, um, the timber can be moved um, more freely because the, the bug isn't active. So it, it opens up our <coughs> opportunities or a, a, a logger's opportunities to move that wood uh, to different markets. So, um, you know, that's something to just to keep in mind as we, as we Did you say the this. May through so October? May to October is called the fly season, so that's when the bug's ap active. Okay, and the so that's not a good time. That yeah. The restrictions okay. on movement are, are pretty small okay. there from October 1st through December or through the winter to May 1st of the following spring. It's the ideal spring. time. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I guess the other part of it is that if we're, you know, if we're taking trees that people have a connection to out of their yards that are in the right of way, um, is there a way that we can replace them with something? And I, uh, I think that biggest cost of that would be digging the hole. Uh, the seedlings and saplings, um, there's, there's a couple different places where you can purchase a, a, um, a native species that's suitable to the site, like sugar maple or red oak or red maple, um, that's not onerous in cost. But, you know, if we're putting a letter out and we're saying, well, mm -hmm. we're probably going to take a tree out of your yard, it would be nice to maybe be able to say that we can replace it. So, so that's I'll a whole lot of information in a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll pull together what we have to right away. Okay. And give you a list. Okay. Um, and I'd love to tell you it's going to be done tomorrow, but oh, it probably yeah. won't be. Well, I'm, uh, I'm <laughs> so we'll work on that. But I do think a plan as we go along would be a great idea. Okay. And, you know. Well, if we if we were uh, if July is when tax bills go out, if we could, you know, sort of know the town right away with and um, put together a package to put in those tax bills before July, sounds is better. that a reasonable? Mm -hmm. I would think. Okay. Yeah, I think that sounds good. Yeah, and then maybe we could talk on sure. a plan for the rest of it yeah. or a schedule, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, approval of licenses, permits, vouchers. That would be great. I move that we accept the general fund accounts payable warrant number 18G24 with checks 18130 to 18160 in the amount of $65,072.79 and the payroll warrant number 18-24 for payroll from May 13th, 2018 to May 26, 2018, the amount of $40,111.57. Second. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. Um, let's see here. Approval of the transitional work policy? Yes, I had uh, given that to you for your last meeting. Um, for your comment, and I was hoping you would, uh, if you agree with it, to make a motion at this meeting and to sign the policy. <clears throat> there was just a couple minor cleanups from the last time, right? The, what, what we did um, from last time, um, we took out suggestions of work jobs right. and to give ourselves a little more flexibility. It does say in the policy um, 
we're not able to guarantee somebody would have 40 hours a week. Right. right. Um, but you put the changes we discussed last time. That's right, I did. I'll move we approve the transition, the transitional return to work policy as presented. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify and say aye. Aye. Those opposed, motion carries. Uh, bid opening for road paving, Dana? We do have um, a bid opening for road paving. The bid went out for Fisher Road. Um, and the reason we limited it to Fisher Road was because of the state grant. Um, depending on pricing and things like that, there may be some adjustments at the end of the project, depending if we have money available for other small areas in town. Um, we have received two bids. I think both gentlemen are, both companies are represented. Okay, sure. Um, so, thank you. I've made cheat sheets for you. Since I like to do this. And so, um, we just need to open the bids. from Pike Industries uh, for to machine pave and cold plane uh, 1810 ton at 93.75 a ton for a total of $169,687.50. Could you read that amount again, Wayne? $169,687.50. And what was the per ton? Ninety-three seventy-five. Thank you. For eighteen hundred ten ten tons. I don't know how to read this, guys. I really don't. <laughs> Here you go. Uh, two of them. So I have a bid from uh, Hutchins. The Fisher Road is a two-inch type overlay, 1,300 ton, $79 per ton, $102,700. This is the price listed is for night work. And then, and then there is um, coal plane. 11,100 square yards, 265 per square yard, $31,005. Again, the price is for night work. What was the per ton price, Pete? For oh, the 1,300 tons. About $79. Thank you. I can read the list they have uh, provide all traffic control necessarily flaggers uniform traffic cold plane is two inch sweep the roadway after cold plane site clean up deliver the cold plane grinding 1300 tons to the town of berlin if requested so it's mm -hmm. to use that um, it's not responsible for the control of any traffic signals during after our constructions and it is understood that any traffic signal loops on the project will be removed during the co-planning process and uh, JHI is not responsible for any damage to any traffic signal equipment caused by the co-planning and we are not responsible to reinstall the traffic signal loops located on the project. That's too bad because that would save us a lot of money. <laughs> 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 um, we had a uh, East Coast signal here um, discussing traffic light situation at the mall and the hospital 
he said, I told him, I said, we're going to co-plane that two inches, and he said, you're going to get into our loop, but he said that um, the light will remain, it'll go on automatically, and then just go through its cycle, instead of, the way it's looped right now is the left lane turning to the mall and the left lane going to the hospital are the only ones that have a loop. So that that's what sets the light all the time. So if they if we take them out of there, he said the lights are still gonna work. But there might not be any cars that's gonna turn to go into the hospital and they're gonna have a green light there. So he said that you're gonna get people saying, Well why is it like over there and we don't have one here and so but he said that that's a real minor thing. But we are waiting on the price of replacing the yeah, new signal system anyway, as we discussed with the budget preparation time. Which we no, don't have that. It'll, the light will still operate if we take them out. It's just and we realize that the it's, the wire in the road or whatever it is is going yeah. to go. Yeah. So how are we on the uh, getting new signals for the that intersection. Are these well, cameras? Um, he just said new de de um, detection system. So I'm assuming it's cameras. I asked him cameras, and I think he said yes. Yes. Didn't he? yes. So he's not going to sock up the in between. N not if we put up new signals. Right. There are lights that are there. The crosswalk light. All that stuff is good. We have to change the controller, the box because that's been there since 1983. Mm -hmm. And it's getting to the point where they can't get parts to fix it. The wiring. The wiring yeah. um, is in pretty rough shape. But I guess what I'm saying is once they grind, we're not gonna worry about the loop. No, nope. it'll be no longer a loop. Right, you're gonna still be out of a loop. Tim has spoken with um, the vendors regarding the hospital access and other considerations there that we need to be mindful of because the reason I did was is because we paved over there we put that skim coat on there last year we had to and it was a nightmare so I suggested night work because the traffic won't be as bad what was um, what was Hutchins Total. Okay, so Hutchins for the Fisher Road paving proposal, uh, 79 per ton, 1,300 tons, 102,700. And then for the co the uh, cold plane proposal, it was 11,700 for square square yards, 265 per square yard, a total of 31,005 dollars. Would be the total cost is 133,705. 133, yep, that's how I read it for 1300 tons. So, can I, can I ask a question? Sure, is this legal? <laughs> so the ninety three seventy five a ton is is the the machine pay plus the coal plant. Coal plant, yep, as requested per ton in the right. document that went out. So another way of looking at it is uh, <clears throat> The grant 
Eighty percent of the cost, or one hundred and seventy-five thousand. It is eighty percent of the cost. We are responsible for twenty. Twenty percent with a ceiling of one seventy-five. Okay. okay, that's what I want. To um, these guys aren't going to be happy for me to say this, but we have in the past taken it under advisement and done our pencil sharpening. And mm -hmm. I will bring it back to the next meeting if the board is more comfortable. Well, this is the issue, and I'll just mm -hmm. say it. The, if we use <clears throat> the tonnage that Hutchins came up with at, at 1,300 tons and use Pike's combined number of coal planting and paving, that makes them a little better. Who's a little better? Pike. Mm -hmm. If you take Pike's tonnage and, and use Hutchins number <laughs> for coal planting and paving and add it together, it's like within seven thousand dollars. So I'm just trying to figure out how the fair way is to do this. That's what I'm trying to do. And I think that maybe we do need to discuss it. There's a five hundred ton discrepancy. Right. That's all. So I move we table this to the uh, next meeting. You can get us out a, uh, a uh, we are second, put that way. Second. Oh, <laughs> any further discussion? <laughs> you get us a, um, a uh, breakdown of all that data? Yes. Yeah. Email it to us. Okay, okay Alan, uh, any further discussion on this? The only discussion I have, and just a suggestion, and sure. I've been telling everyone that we go to, if you guys give us the length and width that you yeah. want, we won't have a 500 ton yeah. discrepancy. Because we're going out there, and I know where the state paved to, I know, so I'm sure that we have different lengths and widths, and that's why there's such a discrepancy. Mm -hmm. If the town just gives us, and again, it's you're basing it on a per ton price, so if you give us 3,000 feet by 40 feet, we're all going to come up within five ton of each other the exact same number. The only, the only issue that I have is that I, the, the, the grinding, I don't, you did it by the square yard, yep. and he did it by the ton, so it's, right. Hard, right. it's hard to make a right. judgment. So right. so we might have clarification questions for sure. you next week. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's the fairest way to do yeah. it. That's good advice. Yeah. All those in favor of tabling this till uh, next meeting? All right. All right. Do you want your carries? contact information? I believe so. If not, I can bring it back. Oh, it's probably in there. It's on there. Oh, okay. Right. And thank I know you. I have yours. Yeah. Thank, thank you both for coming in. Yeah, thank you. We appreciate it. Yep. <laughs>We We have two bids for roadside mowing, and on your cheat sheet, I only knew the name of, of one. So the other one is a mystery one that we'll need to fill in. And here are the bids. Okay, can you help uh, Angelina take and go through the bid? She's going to be able to do this one beautifully. <laughs> I, just, I, I have all the confidence in the world. Thanks, guys. She's going to be my tutor. Yeah. <laughs> I was just guessing what that was. Well, the thing that, that I don't understand is, is I went over there with them and measured it. So why we got... So they had the measurements. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I went right over there and they showed them where we were going to start and where we were going to end and what, what. The only thing that we're not going to do is in front of the state hospital where they paid that extra lane for the buses because they've already paved it. <laughs> and we measured it all. Wheeled it all and everything. Understood, but 500 ton. Yeah. In this case, is $45,000, and that's the difference in the bed, and I think that we need to get clarification or else we might not be giving it to them a little better. Yeah. Do you know the, the, do you know those, the answers to those questions? The, when the, you when you measured it, do you know the, the length and width? Oh, he wrote it all down. Well, I was with him. But he wrote it all down on, on your papers. And, because the state paved in off of 62. 
and they reclaimed that all already. I think or, we, or, we should be able to ask the question of someone what a square yard of grinding weighs. Uh -huh. What's a square yard at two inches? We should be able to figure out what that mm -hmm. includes so we, so we can convert it to ton and then well, I, I was surprised that they went with yardage. Right. Mm -hmm. well, I just, I just think it's the only fair way to make it. Decision. Everybody knows well, that. Well, that's right. You have to do the but calculation. You know, Tim, if you're right there measuring it, jot those numbers down. You know, we might. Oh, I'm going to be there. Yeah, we might as well have them. I'm going to have them. No, yeah. I'm saying before we decide who's doing the job. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to call them both, and I'm going to go over there with them, and we're going to measure it. Well, that way, when they say, and I'm going to write it down. Yeah. To make sure they're both the same. From point A to point B. Yeah. That's the problem when they're doing it by the ton. Because if 1300 is wrong and 1800 is right, then they win. Because <coughs> they're getting paid by the ton. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's, I just want to, I want to know that we're doing, we're giving it to the loader. That's all. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to figure that out because now the numbers are public. Yeah. Sure. We can do that. Okay, Wade. I have a quote from Lamson's Property Services to do roadside mowing in the town of Berlin. It'll be $5,250. This is for one pass both sides and a second pass on agreed roads. Well, he did two passes on all the blacktop last year. But oh. does it say over the rail mower? It doesn't. Because he doesn't own an over the rail mower. And we got to have a, an over the rail mower because the ditches, he can't get close enough. And that was where we had a lot of complaints last year because you could mow as much as he mowed with a push mower. So it's so just that. We went to, and it was in the bid. Right, Dana? Mm -hmm. yeah. That we wanted to um, at least no less than a five foot. Over the rail more. So it says price for mowing roadsides will be fifty two hundred fifty dollars. This is for one pass both sides and a second pass on agreed roads. This may require us to. You might have to ask the question. So, yeah. <laughs> so this is from Donald Dexter in Williamstown. <clears throat> Dear select board members, please find enclosed my bid for your roadside mowing. I have currently two tractors equipped with Tiger brand long arm over the rail mowers. They have a cutting width of five feet, which I believe is the widest available mower in this class. Single pass mowing on proposed streets could be done at a cost of $5,000. However, in order for me to mow the, to the specified Minimum width of 60 as required by your bid spec, uh, specs. I will need to make a second pass on all of your streets. If a second pass is needed, I will take a bid price to $7,500. I'm sorry, what was that price again? $7,500. Okay. If it needed two passes. Mm -hmm. An insurance binder with the town of Berlin listed other insured will be issued prior to any work performed. Sincerely, Donald. Donald Dexter. I would suggest that you take it under advisement so that we could look at research those. I'll make that motion. A second. <laughs> All those in favor? All right. Bid opening. Bid opening. Trail, <laughs> we have. Excuse me. Why? Is it too late for us to submit a bid? <laughs> <laughs> we have two bids for the Trailblazer. Um, one, one I don't. Both of them I did not know at the time, but I only knew. So. So we have two bits. And this is the Surplus Trailblazer 2008.
You want to go first? Sure. I have a bid from a Spencer Tinkham. He's from Randolph. He has a 603 cell phone number. He is bidding $2,777. And seventy-seven cents. Hmm, that's a nice figure. <laughs> and I might mention the base bid was twenty-five hundred. Right. I might have a bid from the Gorman Group in New York, Albany, New York. So places, and their bid is two thousand six hundred and fifty-two dollars. The Gorman Group. Hmm. And in this case, we're not looking for the low bid. Right. <laughs> right. So, I'll, uh, I'll make a motion that we accept the offer of Spencer. Okay. Second. So, uh, any other discussion? Oop, All sorry. those in favor? Aye. 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 Also, I might add that the successful bidder, if the successful bidder cannot fulfill the terms of the bid within seven days, um, would the board like me to bring it back to you, or do you want to go to the next bidder? <coughs> go to the next bidder. Go to the next bidder. It's in excess of our minimum bid. Can I see that? You don't have to re it. This one? Yeah. Yeah. I'm somewhat interested in that one myself. This one? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not the Gorman Group. It's not the Gorman Group that we're thinking of. It's a notepad off my desk. Really? Yeah. That's TJ, right? Yeah. TJ been on it. Okay. okay. <laughs> That's why I was wondering. This. You're, you're going to have to move your notepads. <laughs> <laughs> Because he said he was going to bid. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we're on the back side of it. Okay, um, Browns Mill Road speed limit. We had a letter that came in from Sarah Winters. Uh, Sarah lives on 36 Browns Mill Road. Um, she had mentioned this to Jeremy some time ago, and we never followed through with it, so she uh, brought it up again. Browns Mill Road, as you know, is off of Route 12, um, just past... George Gross's farm. It's a short road. It goes um, um, over the bridge and it, it, to a T intersection. And then the road on the left side goes to a home on the left. And on the right, it goes out to a few more homes. But it um, turns into a private road very shortly. I can't think how many feet. Um, Sarah's concerned about the speed limit, which is 35 down there. Um, I did speak with the uh, police chief about it, and he says he would also recommend that we lower the speed limit. Um, if you decide to go ahead and do that, we would need to have a public hearing on the change of the ordinance and go through the ordinance change, um, as we have in the past. So yes. what are you looking for for a speed limit? Um, that's a very good question. Um, she does not suggest one. The chief suggested 25. Wasn't there, this has come up several times, and wasn't there a press process for this we have to go through with, the, or is that depending That's on what, what I was just saying as far as, you know, if we go, you have to have a public hearing, for, and then the um, ordinance then has a 60-day, um, and I'm not sure what they call that. Do they take you, this you don't have to do a traffic study. That's what I was referring to. They put the hoses and they see what the speed limit is because people have said, oh God, they're going 40 and they're really going 28. Well, I had hoped to avoid a traffic study, but. Um, oh, well, if we can. Where's the, can you remind me where this is? It's on off of Route 12. If you're on Route 12, um, Dog River Farm is, is on Route 12. Yeah. And if you're going toward Northfield, it's the next street on the left. Just before, before you get fire trucks. Before, yeah, exactly. before you go onto the railroad. Oh, okay. Um, bridge. So it's a short. It's very short. 20, road. 20, about 400 feet from route 12 to the to the furthest point. And then there's, you go, like he said, you go across the bridge, and then there's Brown's Mill Extension, and we only plow up there 25 feet. 
So basically, it's neighbors. It's yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the only people driving. On it this doesn't place go anywhere. Live there. You have to. I mean, <clears> you would only go there if you wanted to go to the live there, or you wanted to go visit somebody. So, and just to be clear, I'm not saying that I want to make him jump through every hoop and that and require him to study. I just thought that was mandatory. If it's not. I don't think it's been mandatory in, in the past. I don't see in our records that it has been. Okay. I think it's helpful. Right. Um, if, if you were talking about Crosstown Road, I think I'd give you another. I think another. there's a total of 12 or 13 yeah. people. What did, what did she tell us the day we met down here with the one who built the guardrails? Did she say 12? 12, 12? Probably right on. Yeah. Just not very many people. Are we going to go there and shoot right there? Well, and there's the issue. That's my point. I mean, we can we can make it ten miles an hour, right. but if, if no one's down there to enforce it, I'd have to think of. I would. I mean, it's a road that when you turn onto it, in a very short time, you're going on the bridge over the Dog River, and you come to that T. You have to. You can't be going very quickly to turn there. So does she really think they're going? Faster. Well, she does feel that they're going too fast. She's concerned, as she says in her letter. I think the she's letter concerned about her kids. Yeah, because I read it, it was, it was the kids and whatnot in the road. And they had a basketball hoop on the edge of the road in the driveway, but the kids playing in the road. Yeah, as you turn to the right. Which is a typical Vermont thing for kids to play. She lives in the first house after you come off Route 12. Well, it wouldn't be recommended if you live on 302. Um, before, right. the bridge, or <laughs> right. before the bridge. <laughs> but like you say, it's a good point. We can say zero. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, this happens a lot. People are concerned about speed, and unless we have a police officer available to go and monitor. And right. um, I don't know how many car trips are in and out of there every day, but if you have well, 12 it's, families. It's, what, in the morning trips? when people go to work and when they come home, like, maybe you know, 30 trips a day. We work down here on that road in the daytime, go see the car. That's <laughs> it's not, it's not. I mean, it's you know, it's we right. washed the bridge down here the other day and never had a car until right. it was lunchtime. We had two cars going. Well, that's what I say. I mean, and the reason I referenced the um, road study is that 35 miles an hour when it's four feet in front of you. You know, you could be going 15. It's still quite a, and if you have kids in the road, five miles an hour is too fast. Mm -hmm. So if they're really only going 20, and she wants to lower it to 25, what are we accomplishing if we are not going to enforce it? She's also asking for a children at play assignment. Yeah, I think that's easy. Yeah. That's no problem, we yeah. can do that. <laughs> yeah, I mean. I think the children's giving them the right to play in Rome. <laughs> On a dead end road. Yeah. That, that's that's what the sign does. But it is a warning. I mean, there's something out there. Well, it is a warning, and but I would think that people that live there know that there's kids at the first house. But I, I, I mean, a sign's a sign. I'm not, I don't have any problem with the sign. Yeah. yeah. What I have a problem with is spending the next six months to lower the speed limit when we're not going to enforce it anyway. That's the issue I got. Well, if we wanted to enforce it, you'd need to lower the speed limit. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, I guess that's the best answer. If they're going more than 35. Right. You know, Which we don't know. If right now it's 35. If the police were down there um, monitoring how fast people were going, if people were going, I don't does know how fast you would That going. radar cart that the police yeah. have, does that take in account, does that give you any information back on speed? That's a good question. I'm not sure of that, but I would ask. Yeah, I was just thinking yeah. of that because they have it under the bridge here. Yeah. yeah. Let's put it down there. Okay. Especially if it, if it has if they put it if they put it right just before the bridge, there's plenty of room to get it off the because that road's not very wide. Okay. Just before the bridge, if they set it up right there, they're going to nail them the minute they come off Route 12. I'm not sure if it records or not, but I will speak with Mark about that. Yeah, because if it did, that'd be handy. Yeah. What do we need to put the sign up? Do we have any signs? No, I'd have to get one. But we can get one. Right? You mean the kids at play sign? Mm -hmm. Is what you're talking about? Yeah, not the speed sign. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, we, we better lower the speed. We would like to bring this back. <laughs>
I will speak to Mark about the radar sign, and then yeah. maybe we'll bring it back. Well, if, if that sign, uh, can if we have take any data. It, yeah, can give us any kind of data back. Uh, they would probably put this off till next meeting. I thought they did, but I don't know. You think they would? Yes, you would think if, it would, but then why do you need to do the study with know, the hoses and all that? But you could well, just, the hoses only give you points. Oh, it'll it's just a counter. Yeah, it just counts. Yeah, 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 that's right. Tell us yeah. yeah, but it, I think it does. I think it gives them a rough idea of what they got for speeders, because I know they had a complaint out here on um, Crosstown Road, and she knew from some data what what the average speed was. So um, and they they have it set up out here on Crosstown Road quite often. It was just moved. So I would say have them have them put that down there for okay. A couple else. Months. And I'll speak with uh, right. regional planning as well because they do traffic studies and see what they see. Yeah, probably a weekend and then sometime during the week. Yeah, if they right. left it there for four days, and, you know, like if they set it up Thursday through Monday, Thursday up Tuesday, through Monday, yeah. Yeah. give you a good okay. good idea. Yeah. Okay, so motion to table this till so moved. moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, town administrative report data. Well, for, for, you're fortunate I don't have much of a report this time. Um, I, uh, we are, the assessors have been very busy pulling their figures together. We've been working with them closely so that we can be guaranteed. And once um, they're through you know, getting the grand list posted, I'm going to ask them to come visit with you as per that new policy um, prior to, I'm hoping, prior to setting up the tax rate. Will you ask them to give us a list of the changes? In the you have. Yeah. And I think they can. They just, but I don't. I don't mean because Pete built a deck, but I mean <laughs> we're keeping a very close eye on Pete. But right. Um, but, I'm, but the we, overall changes. Yeah. Yes. If it's ten million dollars, we got to figure out why. Exactly. Till the money I hide under the deck doesn't make the deck worth it anymore. Yeah. Anything else? Dave? That's all I have. Thanks. Okay, Tim, you had something with the grader. Um. Yeah, we got a pretty good problem with it. Um. They've been working on it for weeks now trying to figure out what the problem is we thought it was not transferring fuel from one tank to the other because I could only get down to a half a tank and then it wouldn't run and it has two 50 gallon tanks on one on each side so they came and it only takes air in one spot so he said maybe it's pressure locking somewhere as it's through the fuel cap so we bought a new fuel cap that didn't fix it and then he put a uh, gauge on the fuel line it runs idling is at 40 pounds of pressure and working it is between 80 and 85 because it skips you can't even go hardly so um, I had it out of here the other day and did Comstock Road and and I had 85 pounds of pressure and, and it stayed that way and it, it ran all good all day so then Timmy took it and went and did the Barry Montpelier Road and he almost didn't get back here. But it stayed at 85 pounds of pressure. So they came here um, last Thursday and hooked up to his laptop and he made it run on one cylinder, two cylinders, three cylinders, trying to figure out where we're losing our power and it's the injectors. So. We gotta have all new injectors at a cost of five hundred and forty-three dollars and forty-five cents a piece. So six cylinder. Six cylinder, and um, all the labor, and it comes out to forty-nine eighty-five. The so labor is forty-nine hundred. Yeah, four thousand nine hundred and seven dollars. Three thousand for the part. That's that's an estimate because it, they can't tell if. You know, look at this. Sure. Yeah. Did you it, say the total that labor and parts was yeah. forty nine? Yeah. No total. So it's five thousand dollars. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, I don't and see that we got anything to talk about. 
we're going to have a great day. Right. It's unfortunate. So expensive. Well, I think the policy is anything over about five thousand dollars has to come from the board to approve for purchase. No. Yeah. Um, but it could, it could, is, we could is, be more than that process. because once they get in there, they might right. find that the injector pump is bad. Yeah. Uh, the the main problem they got is the returning fuel from the injectors back to the tank because you got fuel that's circulating all the time is extremely hot. He said. So he said he said that he's. Definite the injectors are gone because that will cause that but he said that when we get in there we might find a pump gone and some other problems. So which has got sixty four hundred hours on it, I believe. Would you be able to maintain eighty five pounds with a bad pump? Uh the pump has nothing to do with that. No, the, 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 the transfer pump is at 85 oh, pounds. From fuel. Yeah. The, yeah. the injector pump is up around 6,000. Yeah. Oh, so, but it, the, the bottom line, as far as I'm concerned, is we need a grader, we need a grader, or else we've got no choice. We need to get a fix as soon as we can. So, okay. I, I move that we go forward with the repair on the grader. But the only problem we're going to have is that he can't give me a definite time when they can come and start working on it. So we, we wanted to be aware that we had a major expense coming up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could be down for a while because it's got so bad now that. Will they loan us a grade? Um, I, I asked about renting one, and nobody has one available. What about Du Bois? <laughs> no, <laughs> I run that one. And I am not grading roads with it. <laughs> Simple as that. And this is the only service uh, place to get. Yeah, this is Cat. No, okay. I mean, we got to ask them to please get here as soon as they can. Yeah, okay. because um, he, I, I see here where he's put down um, travel back and forth every day. So I don't know if it would be cheaper for us to hire Newton or somebody to haul it. To yeah, Richard, ask him if they'd fix it quicker. Because so. I'd rather have them work on it up there instead of in our shop. Well, why wouldn't we ask them if they would start sooner if we just had it delivered there? Yeah. yeah. Okay, but but we could we could be over five thousand dollars, and that's why I wanted yeah. to come and talk to you about it. So when you say maybe a new pump, like how much over? Well, so you're probably looking at. Seventy thousand dollars to get yeah. pump. Yeah. So we could be over ten thousand dollars. Yeah. We could more than double this. Yeah. Well, what's our option at three hundred thousand? I know. I hear you. I hear it. Yeah. Yeah. We're now we're, we're right. at two hundred fifty thousand dollar greater. Yeah. yeah. We're a little short. On the so it's inoperable right now. You just can't. Well, we're going to try. Um, he ran it out here in the dooryard the other day, but he didn't work it, so the fuel doesn't. It's, it's not pumping the fuel and it's not getting hot. So can you damage it by using it like this or does it just not run well? I can ask him tomorrow, but I don't think so. Just the damage has already been done. Yeah. 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 Right. It's just, okay. the injectors are worn out is what it is. But, can we um, use money out of the equipment fund to fix this? Is that? Can we use money out of the equipment fund to fix this? Yeah, but that's, that's getting slim and done. Quick breaking stuff, Tim. Yeah. It's not only breaking, I have to buy a lot of stuff for that. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. What's that? The equipment fund? Oh, oh no, 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 we don't. Have could have you to use it? Yes. Yes. Could we use yes. it? Yes. You, you budgeted money for next year, right? Correct. But I'm saying we could use $8,000 to fix a grader if we need it. And I was saying yes to that question. Yeah. Not yes. When you said it's getting down there, there. I'm saying, <laughs> what did you do with the money? <laughs> oh, oh, we don't want to tell you. I mean, my, my I'm talking about taking it out of the equipment yeah. fund. Yeah. Okay. Fund. Yeah. yeah you're you're thinking of the repair fund. Yeah. 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 I didn't know what you'd spend all the money. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't beer. Well, so, uh, another thing that I'm, I'm going to say to you, I'm not trying to, to buy a new grader, but. Um, when we went to that show a couple of weeks ago, I talked with both the cat and John Deere salesman over there to see if they had one to rent, if we needed to rent one, and either one of them do. But um, they told me that the federal government has a plan for towns now to buy equipment, and that you make a one payment a year thing. 
So if it came to July, we're going to have that money. If, if, if this thing's going to cost us a lot of money, I, I don't recommend it fixing it. Would you say 6400 total time on it? Hours. Hours, yeah. But we're not going to gain for it if it doesn't run. Oh, I don't know. Good. Well, well, it needs to run before then. We need it running now. Right. Yeah. So, right. You know. Yeah. But well, okay. rated in that short supply, it could be good traded on the way it's an operating way. Yeah. 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 Oh, I wouldn't be surprised if we get 100000 or better for it. That's what I'm saying. So we, if we're going to spend eight grand to get a hundred, we need to do it. So right. I'd, see, if, I'd see if we can bring it up there and see if they'll okay. work on it. Right I'll give Jeff Newton a call tomorrow and find out what it will cost us to totally. truck it up there. Yeah. But the other thing is taking get a hold of CAT, make sure they will work on it. Right. If it costs five, six hundred dollars to haul Oh, they'll work on it. Well, you right know, either send somebody here or I'd rather not have them here. Yeah. Because. Right. Well, it ties up the shop, so. Yeah, and, and you just, you know, he came down and worked on the front end of it. That cost us almost $12,000 to fix that. And after he got it all apart, he didn't have the parts that he needed. So they had to run back up there, yeah. and we got tra charged his hourly rate and travel time and yeah. everything else. My point is that hauling it up there, having Newton haul it up there and having him haul it back will be cheaper than paying the travel time. Paying them the travel time. And they'll have the parts. Yep. I mean, we'll be right in the shop, so something yeah, they're trying to tie up their shop. Right. I mean, in injectors, that maybe they're expensive, but you change that stuff. That's not like, you know, you've got like a diesel spark, spark plug. Yeah, yeah, it's not like a crack, yeah. 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 It's just the only like problem is, is they got to tear the whole top of it off. Mm -hmm. The exhaust system, the air breathers, everything's on top of the motor, so that stuff's got to all come out of there because they got to tear the whole top of the motor right down to the, to the end. Yeah. Every time we do that, I want an engineer to come down and make that. So I'm paying them about that. Anything else, Tim? Is it? Yeah. And I'm going to get with those guys with the paving. Okay. Yeah. And I'm going over there. And I'm going to write down every measurement that they have. The problem is they can't change their unit price now. Right. Because they know each other's price. So we've got to calculate somehow. So what I did, and I'll... Now who was high on, on tonnage? I put 1,800 tons. Hutchins at 1300 bucks. Well, the, the only thing I can think of is, is that I told this guy from Pipe that if we have money enough, I want to reclaim from Shaw's driveway through the four corners up here and repave that. So I hope he didn't add that ton in Virginia. The problem is his price per ton includes milk. Mm -hmm. Hutchins price per ton includes just laying asphalt. Mm -hmm. Then they give a square yard price for mill. So you could run Pike's price per ton on Hutchins quantity yeah. and Pike's law. Yeah. Which is what I did. Yeah. But I think to really check it, you need to calculate what a square yard of okay. milling weighs. Weighs. <clears throat> so it would be what, three by three by two inches? Yeah. Because you're grinding at two inches. Right. So if you figure that out, then you've got two checks to see who the little better is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, but it'd be nice to know whether we're looking at 1,300 or 1,800 ton. Now, did I hear somebody say that, that said in there that we could take the millings? Yes. Yes. 13. Both of them? Or just Only one? on one? Well, yeah, but that's, that's one of the recycles. Right, but that's one of the clarifications I think we need to ask. Yeah. We'll come, I'll, because I want some of the dry mix. Well, let's come up with a list of clarifications. Well, one of the things we'll do is mm -hmm. I'll give you copies of that so we can mm -hmm. read it because we haven't seen that if we just open it. Because I'd like to see the bid request. Yeah, I've got one. Because um, I have a, a lot of uses for that grinding support. And we got a whole bunch last year off the of 64 from Kabrickies because they 
wanted to get rid of some of it, so we sent our trucks over there and hauled it back here to the shop, and it's gone. <laughs> that works good on shoulders, it works good on, you know, if they cave in somebody's driveway, you put that stuff down and, and it stays there. Mm -hmm. Where you put down gravel and then they got gravel all over your road, and it, you know, it just, it works good, and I like some of that. Because it's going to be good grindings because there's new pavement over there from right. last year. I mean, it's just a skim coat, but we're going to get some good stuff in there. Alright. Did we have executive session today? No. Is the old still love this? I'll get a hold of Cat tomorrow and see if we can have it down there, and I'll get a hold of Jeff Newton and see what the price of trucking okay. is. I mean, Bellevance trucks too, but I guess get a price so we got a rough idea of what it's going to cost the truck. The thing runs, it's not like it's hard to load. Oh, no, it runs. It runs it, it, when it's cold, because it, he couldn't get it He couldn't get it to skip over here in the door yard. Yeah. But, it's funny, I have some machines, they put fuel heaters in them, and some of them they put coolers in them. Well, he said that normally it runs, the fuel runs pretty cool. And that was his main concern that there might be more than wrong with it than the injectors. Because the fuel, he said, was extremely hot coming back. Well, he said the injectors were bad, were they, were they, blow, were huh. they blowing back into the injectors? Blowing, blowing by, he said. Yeah, so that would heat the fuel and keep mm -hmm. raising. Yeah, that's what he's, you know, he said that's definitely how he knows that the injectors are bad, but. He said that normally it doesn't get as hot as it was. I forgot what he told me of the temperature coming well, back into all that tank. You got three or four of them bad. You're putting a lot of heat back through. Yeah, but he's a little concerned it might be something to do with the pump, too. Good. What did you tell him for a thickness, Tim? Two inches. Two inches mill and two inches overlay. Okay. Come up with a list of questions. But I'm go I went with Hutchins when he measured it, but he's got a thing on the dash of his car that he just sets it and it tells him he doesn't get out and wheel it. And Pike came Friday and last Friday and I was I left Thursday night to go camping for the weekend, so I wasn't around and and he said asked me where we're starting and I said right where the state left off by the emergency room, which is real obvious, and I said we're going all the way to Payne Turnpike. The only thing that we're not doing is in front of the state hospital where they put their bus stop thing in, because that's all new blacktop there. They did that themselves. And I said we're going to do the ramp going towards uh, Montpelier on, on Fisher Road. And, and I said the width is there, so just measure the width of it. Because we're going to go the same way. And he said he was fine. He could figure that out real easy. So, um, I, got an, I got another quick, quick question. Um, we had a lot of pretty close calls down on Payne Turnpike North in front of Northfield Savings Bank. Um, I was wondering if we could put um, a turning lane to go up to the hospital and then a straight lane through. So those cars don't have to stop and wait for all the cars turning to go up to the hospital. Because they, some of them are pulled out and went by and then there was cars coming out of the, the hospital thing because they were in such a hurry to get out of there. Uh, do we have to have a traffic study there or can we just put a turning lane like what we kind of did in front of your store? What what? Which way are you headed? Headed up this way, coming from Montpelier up, yeah. and then they turn to go up to the hospital. Yeah. The lane going down through is plenty wide enough that we could move the yellow line over a little bit and then put a white line. So what you're saying is you wanted to be able to drive past the cars turn into the yeah, hospital? Yeah, because you get you get a, you get traffic backed up quite a ways I'm here. The site view off of uh, Stewart Road. Oh, fine, fine. Yeah, there's no, there's no. I'm just saying, if you push the cars over a little bit, and they have to nose out to get a view down the road. No, no. Okay. No. Because no. once you get past the Northfield Bank on Stewart Road, you can see both ways. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's good sight vision there, yeah, but I mean it's it, it, in the morning times that is crazy down there, and in the afternoon yeah. when they when the hospitals changing shit out, it's just there's so many people turning to go up the hill, and then you got traffic backed all the way up down towards Emmons's house that. A lot of those cars want to go straight through, but there's no there's no lane there. Well, there's room enough, but there's just there's no lane, so they probably don't dare to pass on the right. If there was a lane there, then it would be. Yeah. So what you're saying is we can shuck that line over three feet. Yeah. And create a straight through lane. Yeah, and just put a narrow one to turn up to the hospital and one to go straight through. Who mm -hmm. would have to do that? Yeah, I don't want to be. Well, they're gonna. It, they're, somebody's gonna have to strike. Road, uh, it road, Fisher Road. When we're done, right. for all the crosswalks and all the stop bars and everything. Yeah. So, wherever they use. The only thing is, is the state does all of our yellow lines on our class three roads. So the state's going to be coming. I'm going to call Shauna tomorrow and see if she has any idea when the state's coming because I want to get it okayed from you guys first before I have do anything. So. If, if you guys see it's okay, then I'll just get a hold of Shauna at the state. And L and D's doing the striping for the state this year again. So when they stripe it, I'll just have them move that yellow line over a little bit. Because they put a break in it for the cars to turn to go up the hill. So yeah. when they start back up on the lower side of that intersection, I'll just have them set over a little bit so that we got room enough. And then I'll see if I can't, when they're doing the, the hospital painting on and put a white line and some arrows down there. Can you look at Nina and see what the, if there's a policy on this? If there is or isn't. Uh, well, if there isn't, um, I'll be glad to look. I don't think I've ever seen such a policy. We're, we're not changing the traffic pattern or no, the stop sign. I don't see an no. issue, I mean, with that. It's, it's, when you it's actually a safety. Uh, I don't know, because i got to get a hold of Sean and find out when they're it, because she usually notifies me if they're coming when they when uh, the painters are coming to town here to line force. So, because I I had them change the yellow line in front of Maplewood, so people going down Paint Turn yeah. Pike had a lane to get into, and the cars could keep straight going through there. And then last year they came and painted it and didn't put it back there. <laughs> they just went straight down through, so it screwed the whole thing up. They were late in the season last yeah. year. When yeah, they were real late. Yeah. So it's all worn off now, so you know. Yeah, that's why I say I, I, I want to find out when they're coming, so I want to get that corrected there again. Well, I have no problems with that. I mean, I don't think uh, we're changing it. Yeah. No, not really. All we're doing is making it a little. I mean, uh, some people will sneak by. But some people hang way over to the towards the bank so nobody can get by them. If there was a lane there, then they they would we're realize not, that's where they born. We're not adding a stop. We're not changing traffic pattern. All we're doing is shucking the lane over. I don't think this is an issue. Yeah. Okay. So I guess you could say we have a consensus here. Okay. All right. I'll get a hold of Sean tomorrow and just find out when the find out when the L and D's coming because I want to know so I can. Move that yellow line over a little bit. Give us a little bit more room to make sure we have plenty of room for two lanes. There is, I mean, there's got to be <coughs> close to 12 feet a lane there now. Yeah. So. I have an unrelated question <clears throat> to that, but there's some hedges at the end of East Road that make it very hard to see. <laughs> We talked about that. Yeah. <laughs> they're out of the town. I've almost got it twice already. I know. Sure. They're so. not in there right away. They're not in there right away. I've already okay. uh, I had complaints when I first came here. And we I, moved the stop bar down. Yeah. And we moved the sign down so that people wouldn't stop until they got to the end of the hedge. But it's uh, not making a difference. Yeah. And the hedge is not in there right away. Okay. It's out of the right away. So it is nasty. You want to try to plow that in the winter time. I can't. I can't see anything coming from that. It's dangerous. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. Thanks, Tom. Yep. Thank you. And I want to make sure that I go with those guys and write down the figures this time. All righty. KP Roundtable. Yes, sir. Wait. No, no. XL. No executive. Thanks.
so. Yeah. <laughs> Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So carried.